Um, Ritu is uh, Ritu is there, so please uh, make her co-host. Yeah. Um... Um, Ritu is. Uh, Dr. Ritu, Ritu can you so sp please, uh, uh, switch on your camera as well so that you come to the forefront, you come to the front page? Uh, can you hear us, Dr. Ritu? Can you switch on your as well. Wait, one All right. Um, good, uh, good day to everybody and a very good morning to our friends, committee and so forth in, in North America and uh, United States and Canada and then on to Brazil and Argentina and UK, Europe in the afternoon, Israel and a very good evening uh, to India. And, yeah, and then to Malaysia, and of course to Des and myself and others in Australia, it's so good, it's good, it's good night. All right, so we are here, as you know, for the 36th um, uh, conference, webinar conference, which uh, we've been um, consistently going uh, running. Uh, organizing, which has been um, the hallmark of um, solidarity, where we have the ability to bring all the regions of the world. So, and we have over these many um, um, conferences gone through different aspects, including all the disciplines. We even had economists uh, look at, uh, many in fact, economists and so forth, looking at giving their view. And today is a very uh, important and particularly important um, because we're going to look at another uh, aspect and this is the perspective of patients, the international patients perspective on the ethical and moral dilemmas faced by non-COVID and COVID patients in accessing healthcare, in, uh, particularly during this pandemic. So on behalf of the Department of Education of the International Program of the UNESCO Chair in Bioethics, I welcome all of you, as you all know, around 250 centers in 58 countries over all the continents. That's what this program, uh, our, pro, uh, our centers of this program consist of. And we are now um, going to have two past parts today to today's program. We're going to start off with uh, uh, three presentations, short presentations, Putting the uh, uh, bringing, um, the um, putting us into this what we are looking at, and we're going to have three very distinguished uh, uh, speakers who are going to come. Uh, we go from uh, United States, from United Kingdom, and indeed from the European Union, so in um, um, Belgium. But before I do that, I'll, I'll uh, ask. My uh, the co-chair, 
Dr. Professor Mary Matthew to also welcome all of you and then our, uh, our chat box moderator, Colonel Professor Derek, to talk to you. Over to you, Professor Mary. Unmute, unmute. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Russell, and uh, welcome to this 36th webinar, um, which, uh, which we felt was uh, very, very important because we were talking about COVID all this time. Um, we were not able to get in uh, patients and people who suffered from uh, COVID as well as the, uh, those who didn't have COVID but had a lot of problems. So this, is, this webinar is essentially that. Um, we are going to talk from the patient. Uh, we are going to have talks from the patient perspective, patient advocates, and also um, uh, um, people who have experienced uh, difficulties because of COVID nineteen and non COVID nineteen uh, diseases. So uh, this is. Uh, we welcome all of you, and uh, as as always, uh, please feel free to uh, put in your questions in the chat box. And if you uh, require um, to address it to a particular speaker, please put the name of the speaker also. And uh, we will try to, uh, as, uh, uh, as best as possible, to address all the questions that, um, that are uh, coming in this webinar. So um, thank you. And uh, uh, Dr. Derek, would you like to give any other house rules? Yes, good evening good and good welcome. Evening. Uh, I have already put uh, the YouTube live link into the chat box. I think it's uh, visible there. So please feel free to copy that and you can send it on any of your social media to your friends or other groups. So even if they cannot join on the Zoom link, they can watch uh, the webinar available there. The recording will also be available on the same link subsequently. So you can share that link and people can catch up later as and when they need. Uh, I request everyone, uh, especially those who are joining from their mobile phones, to please ensure that you are muted at all times because there's a sudden background noise which disturbs the proceedings. And also a request of uh, those who are not part of the panel or not immediately involved in the discussion to keep your videos off so that we get a little bit of improved bandwidth. And uh, it's a good experience for uh, everyone. Um, as I said, even our panelists and other distinguished members who are here to share their experiences, the uh, chat box window is also open and visible to all of you. So even if you are not speaking, you can answer the questions in the chat box because I think that will help everyone. We have a lot of students here and uh, we are all co-learners as we use that term because we're all here to learn from each other's experiences. So you can share your experiences into the chat box. Uh, please free, uh, feel free to answer any question or put in your comments there as well. And we'll get your chats or we'll get your comments to the other panelists and to the other members as and when we come to that part of the web. So welcome once again, and back to you, Dr. Russell. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Derek. Look, I want to welcome our, our international committee to here. We have uh, Diz um, Cahill from Melbourne, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Stacey Gallen from the United States from Joe Thornton from uh, Professor Joe Thornton from Florida, um, and uh, Lincoln from Brazil. The, uh, yes, welcome, welcome to all of you. And Gita Lakshmi from uh, India, Professor Gita Lakshmi. Um, let let me uh, in, uh, welcome all our participants. We we have participants from all regions of the world uh, today in this group, right right, right here from, um, from Australia, from the East, uh, China and um, India, 
Asia, and uh, of course, uh, United Kingdom, Europe, North America, and South America, Latin America. So we are once again in solidarity. Uh, we're going to look at this whole, uh, another issue or, or another aspect of the pandemic. So now we're going to start with uh, three presentations, and then we'll introduce the panelists. We have a very, very distinguished group of panelists who are, as Dr. Mary said, patients, patient advocates, and um, uh, in, in, and indeed um, um, people who have actually experienced some of the non-COVID uh, patients as well as COVID patients here who are going to uh, talk to us about the issues that they've dealt with or had to uh, transcend the challenges and so forth, particularly from the ethical and moral aspect. Now, let, uh, we're going to have uh, a speaker, doc, um, uh, Dr. Jesna Karachi. I hope I pronounced it right. I know it's a uh, 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 she uh, um, Croatian name. Uh, Jasna is from the, she's the um, a health diplomat uh, ex expert, and she's a patient ombudsman from the International Council of Patient Ombudsmen uh, of the European Union. She's also the head of patient rights unit of the UNESCO chair in evidence-based medicine. She's also with the Cochrane Croatia Union and it, from the University of Split School of Medicine. And of course, the main purpose of uh, the work of uh, as a patient ombudsman is in supporting the involvement of protection of patient rights. And so she works and co covers the regions of Belgium, Croatia, and Italy in uh, the European Union. And the second, then we'll have uh, a very distinguished, uh, who are, who's a committee member too, Professor Vivian Hartwood. Now, Professor Vivian Hartwood is the chair of health law at Cardiff University. But importantly here, she's going to, uh, she is also the chair of the Welsh National Health Service Confederation at Cardiff, uh, UK. And in this role, she will be um, presenting from the service provider, the health, the National Health Service, their, their issues and so forth. So I'm delighted to welcome Vivian, uh, Professor Vivian Hartwood. And the final speaker will be Dr. Nancy Berlinger, who uh, a very distinguished uh, research scholar at the Hastings Center, which of course, for those of you who don't know, is an independent non-profit bioethics research institute based in New York, in USA. And her works focus on three important areas, bioethics for aging societies, with particular attention to dementia and to aging and housing, bioethics of migration, including the health and well-being of low-income immigrants and migrant workers. And the third is the ethical challenges arising from COVID-19, and of course, she's the lead author of the Hastings Center COVID-19 Ethical Framework for Healthcare Institutions. And also she's been part of the empirical bioethics studies on COVID-19 experiences of healthcare workers of community level responses to the pandemic needs of old adults of migrants. And her international work includes the Singapore Bioethics Casebook produced by the National University of Singapore in collaboration with the Hastings Center. So now she comes in uh, as, of course, she is very much involved with patient care, but from an et as an ethicist. So we'll have these three very important, very interesting presentations. So we'll start, and after that, we will go into the second half, which will be the discussion um, panel discussion moderated by the very uh, distinguished Mary Matthew, who has been doing this um, moderating for uh, the last 35 um, uh, webinars or conferences. And I'll introduce the panel at that time. So can I start and invite 
um, uh, Jesna Keresik, Dr. Jesna Keresik, to please make your presentation. Okay. I, I hope that is visible now. Yes, it is. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, hello to everyone. Uh, thanks to Professor Russell for this uh, interesting introduction. Uh, I think that is very important to share uh, different opinions in over the world. So we are here from the over the world and uh, th I'm very happy about that. I will talk uh, about ethical and moral dilemmas about limiting access to the healthcare uh, from the part of the European Union. And uh, so uh, just a second to, to see the next slide, okay. Um, uh, well, when we talk about uh, health coverage uh, is an effective implement for achieving health as a fundamental human right, but depends on the country's governments and insurance proposed on the alarming levels of disease severity. The novel coronavirus pandemic is appending healthcare as a business, a profession, and human relationship and the possibility that other viruses will represent a world threat soon looks very real. Uh, so obviously that we have some problem. What does that mean for inadequate access to the healthcare? What is that what we have uh, as a complaint from the patients? Uh, the patient management during the COVID-19 has laid bare long ignored risk, including inadequate health systems, gaps in social protection and structural inequalities. Therefore, the importance of basic public health shows the crucial strong health systems and emergency preparedness. Worldwide health authorities put all hospitals uh, on the lockdown by providing only emergency treatment and surgery. Up to date, uh, doctors dealing with the dilemmas of providing or postponing the already scheduled process, which decision depends on the actual situation in the hospitals. It's not explicit, the guidelines process, but could be scaring. And perhaps it's because they don't know what to do as a health crisis put in the shadow of non-COVID-19 patients. And then patients are faced with a highly controversial interventions in their treatment and also accomplished restriction in visiting dying relatives, force the basic right severely to be impaired. Furthermore, we call attention also to the legitimate concerns regarding the potential for the uh, violation of these patient rights because this protection should be always the first point out. So uh, though we have a fear that we have a sufficient capacity in the world hospitals, during the initial wave of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, hospitals worldwide diverted resources from something routine inpatient critical care and outpatient clinics to meet the surge in demand. The COVID-19 might be affecting the hospitals for the next next years. Uh, so sustainable development must, be, uh, must go behind the national strategies and calls to take urgent actions to stop the spread of the virus and avoid the potential risk of increasing death of other disease. This is called global health diplomacy. International Council of the Patient of Dosman has a strong consensus for improvement in communication uh, uh, to follow universal source uh, control by diplomatic relation to providing non-COVID-19 clinical care during the pandemic. Because uh, up to date, the outcome of limitation in access to the healthcare was happened in all the world to protect patients remains absolutely uh, unclear. We don't have evidence that this helped to uh, uh, patients. So what we can learn from a pandemic. Uh, uh, so we have the situation, uh, we have the situation uh, now in the Europe and all the world that the COVID-19 pandemic has changed how healthcare is delivered in the countries and has affected the operations of healthcare facilities. Although the impact of public health trades uh, globally showed the risk for chronic, especially oncological patients, that is very important. We will see, uh, see after why. It shows our uh, reassurance of unreasonable defensive medicine as well. 
It might be useful in the future to check the effectiveness of reducing diagnostic procedures in the fact of where to the future possibility of malpractice suits. Because we know the practice in Europe is uh, today like this, that the doctors want to uh, send all patients to, to do all possible diagnostic to avoid uh, uh, some uh, procedures after uh, as a malpractice. So uh, the, the, the following the protocols is, uh, is uh, evidence-based medicine, but we, we need to uh, maybe uh, to come back a little bit earlier to, to use uh, our over, uh, over uh, the, the possibility to detect, detect that something's uh, wrong occurred. Limitation to hospital access in the some countries show better implementing of the informatization to restrict the waiting list. Uh, in Europe, we have many countries where the waiting list is uh, about for magnetic resonance uh, one year or two years also in some countries. So that is no uh, any more waiting list. This is uh, uh, not possible to, to have uh, healthcare uh, protection. Following this, we direct attention to the use of telehealth, email consultation, uh, what is an example of a very good practice now is uh, in pandemic, but is also a power, powerful uh, tool in the situation post pandemic. Uh, efforts should be made to apply all the measures and procedures that could protect the patient when visiting a doctor and educate patients to be responsible. This is also very important because in the safe mode managing, uh, the best thing is uh, to encourage the patients to be responsible uh, to the hospitals, to the healthcare providers. Uh, so in the, in, the, in the core of all is, of course, patient safety. So that, that is uh, uh, why it's important to have the balance about providing or postponing uh, health care, because patient safety is always the first point. Principally is to adopt and provide necessary in-person clinical services for condition other than COVID-19 in the safest way possible, minimizing disease transmission to patients since no evidence the lessons in diagnostic and therapeutic process show effectiveness in stopping the spread of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The impact of the COVID-19 outbreak has raised significant concerns for patients. Moreover, increased the number of queries from health and social care organizations regarding specific patients' rights they are treating and caring for. So that is also important what we have as a feedback. For instance, considering that the number of cancer and other chronic disease cases diagnosed every year are increasing, the consequence of these skipped appointments is that there will be a high number of undiagnosed conditions that will uh, not be detected until, uh, the, uh, uh, until the following appointment uh, when the disease could be worse and maybe no longer treatable. So we will have a higher rate of deaths from cancer than uh, from COVID-19. Follow-up consultation resulted in a package of recommendation for consideration by research units, educators, healthcare industry, policymakers, and funding bodies to cover the current knowledge deficit in the field and uh, to introduce integrative approach for advanced diagnostic, targeted prevention, treatments, tailored of the person and cost effective healthcare. So most importantly, uh, it should not come uh, down uh, to choose something uh, to, between uh, COVID-19 treatments or cancer treatments, but both diseases should receive the same attention, not only cancer, but this is an uh, alarming condition. The healthcare system should be reaching a point in which it can be able to treat both, all conditions and the problems uh, uh, which a patient have. On the front line, the COVID-19 evokes anxieties and fear seen, and more than never before, health professionals need to protect and defend the fundamental rights and safety of their patients now. It's not possible to accept a new normal uh, only by treating a patient with suspected coronavirus. That is the situation what is uh, happened uh, in some countries in Europe. Finally, we need to find the best response on the hospital care management without allocating other important disease and keep the patients uh, informed on the risk and the need to certain medical behavior. So uh, for the conclusion, uh, instead of the conclusion, uh, uh, we need to understand better the tracking statistic uh, so that we clearly see how the patients we affected in relation to their non-COVID-19 health problem. 
Uh, currently, we see many different numbers, and it's not clear whether that are due to COVID-19 or that occurred uh, with, uh, but not directly from COVID-19. Figuratively, if you are shot, did you die from gunshot or died with the bullet? So I'm happy to 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 discuss uh, with you. Uh, that is uh, our contact. If you have uh, additional questions, you, you can always send them by this email and. I'm happy to, to, to see uh, your opinions. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jessna, uh, for your um, uh, uh, putting this important aspect there. Um, all of you, uh, if you need to address, you have the chat box, and uh, Jessna has come up as a patient ombudsman coming to you with what she has heard and what, uh, from a patient perspective, and now I'm going to uh, ask uh, our distinguished next speaker, who's going to be Professor Vivian Hartwood from Cardiff University, but more importantly, her focus is going to be from the service pro the, the National Health Service, um, which she chairs the Confederation of Wales. And so as a service provider, over to you, um, Vivian. Well, thank you very much indeed for, for this opportunity to give a presentation in your wonderful um, webinar series. Um, I obviously will be dealing with this from the perspective of non-COVID patients in the UK. Uh, and much of what the previous speaker, Jasna, said was uh, very familiar to me. It's, it's, it doesn't come as a surprise, sadly. Um, I also would like to um, share my presentation with you. So I'm trying to put that on screen. I'm not sure that I'm doing it very well. Try again. There. Um, there you are. Mm. You want to, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Right. Um, so um, I speak today as chair of the, the NHS Confederation in Wales and also as the chair of a health board, which is responsible for providing health care services to patients living within a very large geographical area in the centre of Wales, where along with Scotland and Northern Ireland, responsibility for health care services is devolved from the central UK government. Uh, I also speak from the perspective of a lawyer. Um, and in order to set the context from the start, I want to emphasize that we regard our patients as crucially important in all that we do. Without them, we would not exist, um, but we do have some very, very difficult decisions to make. And we've never tried to hide any of our patients or to marginalize them. It's just been so difficult dealing with this pandemic, which came as a shock to the UK um, we really were not prepared for it properly at all. I want to begin by showing you uh, a quotation, which I have permission to share with you, um, from a journal in the UK called The Justice Gap. And um, it was, it's a, a legal journal, really. And this uh, article I'm going to refer to was put together by lawyers who've been colleagues of mine in the past. Um, and that the headline you see there is the non-treatment scandal, the hidden victims of COVID. Mm. Um, and and as, they, as you can see there, they express concern about the impact uh, on people who are non-COVID patients, um, including, um, as, as you see, they're worried about uh, avoidable harm and death, um, the non-availability of diagnostics, and the backlog, the building backlog of cases, and they're there imploring governments to take urgent strategic action to prevent a second and perhaps more serious um, catastrophe. So we, we're all worried about it, we're all aware of it, and that's the uh, A group, a specific group of, I would say, left-wing lawyers. Um, they go on then to talk about the, the problems, uh, you know, obviously, one of them is that not only are um, non-COVID patients not being diagnosed in time, um, but they're not getting any say at all about uh, which risks they would rather take between their established condition uh, and, and be between that and exposure, uh, exposure 
to the virus. So it's, it's a very, very difficult position. They're being denied treatment, they're being denied access to treatment, and they're being denied choice, which is extremely bad. And um, the, the difficulty is that we have to try and find some way out of this. I want to point out then that um, in the UK, we have um, a way of looking at COVID, which is particularly used in Scotland and Wales, through what we call the prism of the four harms, um, which is the harm that can be done by COVID itself and all the suffering from that, and the deaths and the tragedies for families, and then the harm that could be caused if the NHS itself, the National Health Service and social care were to be overwhelmed by COVID. And then, and this is in no particular order of importance because they're all equally important, a harm from the reduction in non-COVID activity. And, um, you know, waiting times is one of, what just one of the factors there. And then finally, the, the wider societal harms, which have been talked about in some of the earlier webinars, restrictions, lockdowns, problems in education and the economy and so on. So it's, it's a huge picture that's threatening not only the UK, but the whole world and everyone in every country is concerned about it. Um, so who are these hidden victims that um, they talk about? And actually, if you look at um, what they said in that article, in, in that uh, Justice Gap journal, there are echoes of the four principles of bioethics identified by Beecher and Childress, very important in uh, healthcare and frequently referred to autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. How can we do justice for these patients by making the right decisions? And this list of um, um, people who derived from the data are, uh, you know, include what you'd expect really, cancer patients, but also patients awaiting thoracic surgery, routine screening, diagnostics, cardiac surgery, transplants, orthopedic surgery. The list for orthopedics is huge now, just people waiting. And then all those people um, waiting ophthalmologic, ophthalmological procedures. I don't think I've got that word right there. Um, you know, people waiting for their cataract surgery and so on. And finally, um, most importantly, because there's an emerging problem with mental health patients. But, but how do we know who these patients are? And we do know, and we have known from the start, um, we have systems, as do other countries, very sophisticated systems for tracking patients. Um, and we have sort of waiting times, um, um, data for planned and unscheduled care throughout the UK. We, we know what the lengths of waits are in our emergency departments and our ambulance response times. But we also get information from general practitioners who see patients in the community. And um, we get information from patients groups, from coroner's inquests, and very importantly now from the media. And this is taken actually from the British Medical Journal um, recently showing the picture and I'm not going to be afraid to present the slides, um, the, the figures are awful. We know that and we're trying to do something about it. But if you take there, um, if you look at that slide, you'll see that um, the people waiting for elective care are huge in number. Uh, and even people just waiting for their treatment to begin, we have about 4.46 million patients just waiting for their, their treatment to begin. In emergency care, we can see that um, patients are waiting longer than 12 hours, many of them, um, just to be seen or admitted to an emergency department. Cancer patients are not being diagnosed. We expect uh, very many more to be diagnosed than 3,000, the 3,500 fewer um, who, who would have been diagnosed with bowel cancer, and that's because of failure in diagnostics and then uh, the, the cardiac patients. So it's, it's a very sad um, statement that, that you see before you. Um, some more data there, just in Wales, you see um, waiting times for hospital treatment, people waiting for referral to go to hospital from primary care. 
and the, the numbers going up there um, very substantially. More recent data, and this was, uh, this was published last week. Sorry, it's got to go back again um, there. Number of patients in England waiting over a year for routine hospital care is now 100 times higher than before the pandemic. And you'll see there that um, hip replacement surgery is a real problem. Um, in Wales, for trauma and orthopaedic, the waiting lists are up by 500% in a year. And the Royal College of Surgeons is warning that patients are being left in, in pain and just unable to deal with day-to-day -day life. So this is a crisis, crisis which can't be cured overnight um, because of the pandemic and, and it's, it's tragic. So are we, how are we prioritizing patients? And this is important um, on the basis of what? Um, in the early days, it's obviously been on the basis of practicalities. Um, there was a need to treat COVID patients more urgently because of the gravity of their condition. Um, so that meant then that uh, priority two surgery, such as cancer, urgent cardiac surgery and so on had to be postponed even though we recognize that it was medically necessary to be done within 28 days. And that was because of redeployment of staff from their normal roles to help with this huge volume of patients coming in with COVID. So anesthetists would be moving from general surgery, perhaps right into ICU to help um, with COVID patients. And then on top of that, we have many staff uh, who are ill with COVID, um, who are testing positive, having to self-isolate, uh, or maybe suffering from stress, mental health problems. And that created terrible problems for us logistically. Uh, and then, um, you know, infection control um, procedures had to be put in to ordinary waiting areas, for example, in accident and emergency departments. So um, you couldn't, you had to have separation of patients, screens and all those sorts of things. So they had to be suspended for a time, even in, non even in outpatient departments. So then there was the problem of patients who were actually afraid to go to hospital in case they caught COVID. And we can see that the number of people attending A&E, accident and emergency, uh, had decreased. So pay people were sort of putting up with pain, um, which they shouldn't have been doing. So are these um, prioritizing decisions decided by those practical issues or are they guided by ethics and law? And certainly they should be. Um, right at the start of the pandemic, uh, a few of us um, got together and decided that it was absolutely urgent to produce some sort of ethical guidance for our clinicians who are having to make on the spot decisions. Um, we did, <laughs> but each of the UK countries uh, has a um, moral and ethical advisory group, and I'm a member of that one uh, in Wales, um, and we've produced guidance. Um, but in addition to that, uh, that guidance, which I hope is being used as much as possible, there are numerous um, legal imperatives. We have common law and statute. We have equality, human rights law, we have uh, judicial review actions if organizations fail to follow the correct procedures. Um, and interestingly in Wales, public bodies from the 31st of March will have to uh, consider socioeconomic uh, disadvantage as a matter of law when making strategic decisions. And that should very happily, I hope, feed into the dilemmas that we have about uh, prioritizing COVID patients. Um, so what are the options for these patients who are feeling hidden or forgotten? And it's very sad that they do. Some go to the media and we have regular reports on television showing footage of patients struggling to live their lives in, in an ordinary way on a day-to-day basis because they're in so much pain. Um, they may seek advice from patient groups and we have some excellent patient groups in uh, the UK as they obviously do in other countries. We have an NHS complaint system, an ombudsman. Patients have the right to bring equality claims or judicial review claims, or even clinical negligence claims, which already um, cost a huge amount of money in compensation and costs. And so if they want to use the law, um, 
patients would have to consult a lawyer. Over the years, there have been very many successful claims by patients who suffered as a result of de delayed diagnosis and treatment. Um, will that be the same following the pandemic? Uh, I don't propose to lead you through the tangled web of complex law around all this. We don't have time anyway, but it, it's extremely interesting. Suffice it to remember that patients who are damaged as a result of negligence have a right to compensation, but um, they do need to take some responsibility for their own health, be involved in their decisions and, and so on. And we mustn't forget that there's buried treasure among these um, so-called hidden patients uh, for lawyers representing patients who want to bring claims, which is um, of course a financial incentive for lawyers to get involved. Um, Patients do have a right to appropriate information to enable them to make choices. And clinicians should be giving them the time to make those decisions in a rational way. We don't even know at the moment whether they're getting all the appropriate information that they need. And there's also an NHS constitution applicable in England and uh, Scotland, setting out some very important rights for patients, which again, something I don't have time to go into right now. So just for reassurance, these patients have not been forgotten. Managers and clinicians together are seeking clinically led solutions to ensure that all services are sustainable as far as possible into the future. And don't forget, we will have a large cohort of patients with post COVID syndrome or um, long COVID as we call it here. Uh, Plans have been made throughout the UK to reset the NHS. Um, groups get together weekly um, to discuss how this is going to be done. And we all have to submit plans to our governments. Um, and in addition to that, there are numerous innovative um, forms of treatment which are being used, of course, throughout the world. You know, video consultations regularly taking place, virtual groups uh, for therapy interventions from voluntary organizations and so on. And there's regular collaboration between patients, I'm sorry, and um, healthcare professionals. And finally, the law may be on the side of patients, but it's very, very complex in the UK. I hope very much that we will have very soon clear guidelines based on evidence and ethics to guide us through this maze. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vivian, for that um, uh, presentation from another perspective from the National Health uh, Service. Um, and those who want uh, to ask questions or comments can, on the chat box, address it to Professor R Vivian Hopwood. Okay, thank you very much. And now it's uh, my pleasure to uh, invite and introduce uh, I've already introduced Dr. Nancy Berlinger. Um, and of course, Nancy now going to, is going to present to us uh, from another perspective as an ethicist from the Hastings Center. So Nancy, over to you. And I think you're going to talk without slides. Is that right? Correct. Very good. So okay. uh, over to you. And let's okay. let's. Uh, well, good morning to everyone from New York City, where, where I am right now. Uh, I am a research scholar at the Hastings Center, which is an independent, so non-university uh, affiliated uh, bioethics research center founded over 50 years ago and located about 50 miles to the north of me in uh, Garrison, New York. Usually um, on non-COVID times, we have a very active visiting scholar program. It's a residential program. We have many um, visitors from around the world. And I hope uh, when uh, we are able to restart that program, uh, I will hear from you because uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to learn from you and for people to get on with uh, some of their own work. So what I'm gonna talk about today following these two really excellent presentations that gave us so many different levels of what goes on in the bioethics of pandemic and their knock-on effects, their, 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 their larger effects for a health system. Uh, I really wanna thank my colleagues. Um, 
I want to uh, get into a bit more of, of why we talk about the patient's perspective and why we think this is important in bioethics and in the closely related area of medical humanities or, or health humanities. And then I'm going to talk about three situations uh, where uh, both coming from COVID and uh, not specific to COVID, uh, where we can maybe explore this a little further, give us some food for thought. So I'm not going to use slides. Um, so uh, first of all, why is the patient's perspective or what's sometimes called the patient's voice and perspective so important? Why do we always write that down as something that's very, very important? Um, I think I, the screen just flipped, I, uh, just so we know. Um, but anyway, I will continue. Um, for one thing, there is the recognition of the humanity and the rights of the patient as a person. That's very important with respect to human rights, uh, to uh, various codes that represent human rights. And even if you're working outside of a, a, a human rights framework, uh, listening to a person is a demonstration of respect for a person. So that's why it's so important that we don't say once a person is ill or needs medical treatment or in some other way or depends on a medical system or a care system that they somehow are less of a person. Uh, it's very important to, to understand their, their perspective on, on their humanity, including when a person is um, experiencing um, illness or disability or, or, or anything else really. Um, second, it's important because it's part of decision-making. Uh, we often think about in bioethics, uh, the importance of, of treatment decisions. This is certainly not the whole of bioethics, but we often see it, especially if we work in a medical context. We think about uh, how do we make decisions, especially when a person lacks a decision-making capacity. So we tend to talk about listening to the patient, not having the doctor or a family member make a decision and a person can tell us uh, about their own experience and what they might want or not want. And this isn't a hard battle between say, Western autonomy versus, you know, these very centralized ideas that, oh, um, uh, in Asia, the family decides. And I've, I've done a, a, a work in different Asian countries and people will say, well, you know, it usually comes down to um, a, 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 a dispute in a family. And I'm like, oh, just like in the West, because we have families too. So, um, so often when we're thinking about the perspective, it isn't just this hard idea of who has the right to make the decision, which is important, but it's also how do decisions get made? Where is the patient in that constellation of decision-making? It's obvious that when a patient is a child, for example, especially a baby, um, someone else is making the decision, but we're still to say, what would this person's life be like with or without this particular uh, decision? So you're, you are always trying to get the patient's perspective in there, even if the patient themselves perhaps doesn't have a, a voice at that time or, or doesn't have, uh, can't tell us too much about what they want, maybe because they're very young. Um, and so another reason uh, that patients' uh, perspectives are so important is that they are crucial to reflection on a system, whether it's a medical system or a care, a larger care system. What do the people in the system think about how the system is doing? So that's why you see um, patient and family advisory councils. You see uh, opportunities for people to both praise and uh, and critique a system, but it's very important to have that, shall we say, the user perspective on, on a system. So um, uh, quality improvement, uh, patient safety, this is, is quite important. What we have to remember in those contexts is that uh, they could easily privilege some voices over another. For example, uh, people who have the uh, pre-COVID, people who have the ability to travel to a meeting might get heard more often than people uh, who, uh, who, for reasons of economics or health, were unable to travel. Zoom has been a great leveler in that respect. It has made um, the participation of patient, people in different states of health uh, more, more equitable. That's good. And we should hang on to some of those things. We shouldn't be so quick to race back and say, oh, now we're all going to get on planes and go about our lives. We should remember that remote access it, reduces barriers to participation for many people. And that can include people uh, who are in the role of patient or for whom being a patient is, and in relation to a system is part of their life. 
So uh, um, I think I'm hearing something, but I can't hear it very well. All right, there's a bit of cross check, I'm sorry. Go ahead, uh, 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 Nancy, go ahead. Okay, I think it's thank someone you. else uh, who hasn't mm -hmm. muted their... Uh... Okay, okay, so that wasn't for me, thank you. Okay, so I think we, we all know by this stage, a, a year into pandemic, that um, the vulnerabilities of any health system have been mercilessly revealed by the experience of pandemic. COVID is like a searchlight. Um, and we certainly, and not just health systems, but societies. I, I would certainly say that's true in the United States. Um, all of the inequalities that we tolerate in a society are revealed through the inequities that present um, in, in, in all aspects of pandemic. And I, I'll say more about that later. But the concept of vulnerability comes through very strongly um, in, in times of, of, of health crisis. And that's why we have to start uh, looking for the patient's voice in COVID. And I was talking with a colleague in uh, London just last week. We were both saying, you know, we had both worked in uh, HIV AIDS a long time ago. We were saying, you know, compared to HIV AIDS, compared to that pandemic, which, which um, resulted in the deaths of 30 to 40 million uh, people globally, we haven't heard as much from patients in COVID. And we can see why. It's still a fairly young health experience. Um, we have uh, the experience of COVID means that people have been in isolation, in some cases intubated, too sick to talk about the experience. Of course, people who have died are not able to comment on their experience. Because of isolation, families have usually been uh, unable to be at the bedside. So there have been all sorts of use of, of, of um, uh, uh, iPads and phones and any way you could to maintain a contact with families. I'm part of a study right now where we're interviewing frontline doctors in two cities in the United States. And we are already hearing about how haunting that is. Just the idea that when you're a doctor and you're trained to care for a patient and a family, the family isn't there. So you know that patient isn't having the support that you would, you would hope that a critically ill person would have. The family isn't getting information in anything like a timely fashion, nor do they have the presence of their loved one. And you feel like you're kind of letting the patient down in a way, you're, you're, the, the patient isn't, isn't getting even under these conditions, even under being very ill, they're not getting what they need. So, so this is something that, that medical professionals are going to have to unpack. And um, I think you would see that you could relate to this in your own countries as well. It isn't enough to call people heroes um, or angels or anything like that. We are going to have to listen to the experience of these providers um, much more closely. Uh, but we're also going to have to figure out to, to understand what this experience is like for patients who survive COVID, for their families, um, and also for uh, people who are um, dealing with what's called, what uh, Dr. West would call long COVID, we call it long haul COVID, the same thing. It is the still not well understood phenomenon of, of a chronic aspect of COVID. Um, we, there was a very good um, series in the Washington Post here in the United States of, of voices uh, of, from interviewing different people about COVID. And there was a perspective the other day from a young woman who had long COVID. And uh, it's, it's quite a devastating and very hard to understand experience. There's no book you can turn to or website about this yet. Um, there are some support groups, but uh, thinking about this as an ethicist, I'm in interested both in listening to that voice and making sure I don't think about the hospital perspective all the time because chronic Ill illness disability tends to be outside of a hospital context. But I also am thinking about the fact that when we think about anything chronic or disabling, we tend to marginalize it. We think, well, that's bad luck. You know, I guess you and your family will just have to deal with that somehow. When it's out of the hospital, we, it tends to be so much less visible. So we're going to have to think about that patient's voice, how we listen to this person, and how we use their experience to build out our already hard-pressed health systems because to accommodate this experience of long COVID that we don't understand very well yet. So that's something to keep your eye on with respect to pandemic. Now, 
in terms of look switching, because we were also asked to think about non-COVID, um, um, I'd like to ask you to think about a very common condition, especially in aging societies, that is not so much a health system experience, it's a care experience, um, and that would be dementia. It's strongly associated with aging. So in aging societies, which tend to be wealthier societies, um, where uh, the, uh, the lifespan is going up, people have more and more um, uh, likelihood that they will develop some form of, of dementia. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. Um, it's a condition, it's progressive, ultimately terminal, and it's associated with changes in brain changes that cause changing in thinking, um, in communication, in how one uses and processes language, in, in other aspects of physical functioning, and, and eventually a person needs more and more care, often initially provided by family members. The typical place where a person with dementia is, especially a person who doesn't have other comorbid conditions, is at home. Um, has a long trajectory lasting years. Typically a person is, is in their home or maybe in the home of a family member, may live in a care home at, toward the, especially when they need um, round the clock care. But um, we tend to see it as a problem, a, a, as a failure of a system. When a person with dementia is winding up in the hospital over, uh, over and over again, it tends to mean that there is some breakdown in, in a care system that you would hope uh, would, would keep them out of a place that can be uh, very disorienting uh, for a person with dementia. So um, I have several different projects uh, on dementia underway. And some of the interesting things about this, and I, I really recommend for, for people in bioethics who are interested in dementia is you want to get to know people who are gerontologists. Not ger Geriatricians are great, uh, doctors, older people, but you want people who study aging because they work on dementia all the time. And it totally enlarges your perspective beyond thinking about hospital patients and capacity. Dementia is much more than decision-making capacity. So, um, and it also acquaints you with um, ways of approaching this disease and supporting its experience that are not primarily medical, but they're more, they're more social. They're more about supporting a person's experience um, and providing stronger community supports. And, and I'll say a little bit more about that. But returning to the patient's voice, it's very easy to overlook the perspective of a person who has difficulty thinking uh, and has difficulty communicating. It's very easy to overlook the perspective of a person who's older for, for reasons that have to do with ageism and ableism. Um, we might assume that people with dementia have nothing to say about their condition because they have difficulty processing language. And this is why it's, it's helpful to uh, sort of get, start hanging out with, with a geront usually gerontologists or, or other um, researchers, maybe anthropologists who do a lot of interviewing of people with dementia. They'll say, you know, you, you begin to understand how people with this particular um, cognitive um, use language. Um, you can, uh, they, they can tell you quite a bit about their own lives. Um, and um, I think some of the things that we are also seeing are that there are different ways to support this experience that involve carers, family carers, uh, uh, professional caregivers, um, like social workers, for example, uh, but also researchers. And I'm um, glad to see that uh, 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 Vivian Westwood is from Wales, because one of the most interesting groups I've seen is a Northwest Wales Dementia Network. There networks in different parts of the, the world, but Wales is, has got great ones. And what you see there is a network of, of community-based organizations, academic researchers, people with dementia and dementia caregivers understand this experience. And then to try out different community services that improve the lives of people with dementia, just give people their experience living in, in the community. So um, there's also very good work from the World Dementia Council based in London on these networks worldwide. They've just two reports to understand how in different parts of this idea is moving forward. Um, I should add that horrifying experiences during COVID. Uh, we've seen outbreaks in care homes. So they've had high mortality and morbidity. 
by, by virtue of their age alone, they are at higher risk uh, for, for, co for severe COVID. Um, and they have often been uh, very isolated due to infection control in, in nursing homes. Um, and of course, it's difficult, it can be difficult for them to understand what is going on. So that, that has, that's going to be a rec from experience. And we're going to have to keep an eye on this. There's a new post pandemic layer of analysis to every aspect of bioethics. And this is one area, although it's not as, uh, as medicalist an area that we're going to have to keep an eye on. And finally, uh, I just want to go back uh, to thinking about uh, COVID again. Um, I was, when Vivian was talking about harms, I was, um, that was, that really resonated with me because I've done a lot of work on medical harm, um, is that harms are done through delays in care, uh, was, which is what you saw in Vivian's slides. Um, and so one of the enormous global delays that we're seeing right now is delays in vaccination access, um, in access to the vaccines and to actual vaccination. This is very unequal. It's very unjust. Um, the wealthier countries like mine um, have reserved a great deal of the supply. Many countries in the world haven't had any vaccination yet. So in order for people to from the experience of pandemic, we, are, we in bioethics should be participating in the not exactly bioethics, but closely aligned movement of global health justice. Um, we need to be thinking not only about ethics, what's the right thing to do, but the conditions of our societies. Um, and to, to consider how should, you know, when we look at future pandemics that affect the entire globe, what does the entire globe need? So there, these are very interesting conversations that include political philosophers, they include health policy experts. There's a lot of interesting webinars people can be part of. And um, it's a good area to keep in mind as you, you are thinking about um, issues of, of vaccine access in your own uh, uh, regions. So thank you very much. And um, I look forward to any questions and discussion. You're muted, Dr. Russell. Sorry. Thank you, Nancy. That uh, was um, um, enlightening there, looking at it from a different perspective. And uh, you can ask, you put your questions, Nancy, in the chat box. And now we come to uh, thank you, all the three speakers. Thank you very much for your presentation. And now uh, we come to the, um, the important where, um, uh, part where we're going to have a good discussion. And very importantly, we have a very distinguished uh, group of panelists that cover our globe. We have uh, Dr. Um, um, uh, Victoria uh, Peaky Atkinson, who um, is from South Africa, and she is the director of the South African Non-Communicable Capable, uh, Communicable Disease Alliance. And of course, Vicky um, is, is uh, also um, a patient, has been a patient, uh, and uh, long for a long term had dif difficulties with joint destruction and so forth. And um, she's going to uh, be a panelist from South, South Africa, enlightening us on the issues from South Africa. And then we have, um, uh, um, uh, we have uh, Faith Walker, who lives and works in Wales for the, uh, over the last 25 years. And uh, she works alongside communities as part of the Welsh Government All Aboard. And she's a board member with the Public Health Wales and a member of the Wales Committee for Equality, Equality and Human Rights Commission. And be, has been a very active patient advocate for many years. She believes in encouraging children, young people and families and communities to become active citizens. And of course, she's going to be the panelist from United Kingdom. We then have uh, uh, Mark Weir uh, from Canada. Uh, and um, Mark is the Director of Strategic Planning and Community Engagement at Woodstock Hospital, where he's led the development of a new strategic plan for the hospital as well, uh, as well as he engages the community and patients and families in the work of the hospital 
and the Oxford Area Ontario Health Team. But he also has, uh, in the past, led a team in patient engagement, supporting the Minister's Patient and Family Advisory Council. So Mark is going to give us, from Canada, um, an opening into what's happening and how this corresponds uh, to what we are, the theme of today. Um, then I have the, uh, the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Alexandra Basante Montenegro. She, of course, is from Brazil. She's a, the founding partner of uh, Basante and Montenegro. She's a lawyer and, of course, uh, for the Medical Association of Brazil. But importantly, she's a, a, a advocate, a patient advocate, and works with, uh, with the Medical Association of Minas Gerais uh, in Brazil. And um, we'll have, uh, we also have with us um, Josie Chu, as you can see, from Hong Kong. And Josie is um, here with us um, as the panelist from Hong Kong. But importantly, she was, uh, after being diagnosed with spinal mus muscular atrophy, which is, of course, all of us know, a fatal terminal condition, she spent 17 years in a life living in the hospital. Her entire life is on a wheelchair and relied on life support machines, such as a ventilator, suction machine, oximeter, and so forth. But she is a student of the University of Hong Kong and is the secretary of the, for the Pediatric Home Respiratory Support Society since 2017. And she's organized several events at schools in the hopes of promoting equality, inclusiveness, and of course, um, for children with the respiratory issues. So she's going to join us uh, uh, and offer her, service, her um, thoughts. And finally, we also have uh, Captain, Dr. Ka Captain Dr. Ritu Biani, who's a dental surgeon, um, a cancer warrior, uh, and of course, um, she, uh, she's the first lady paratrooper, mountaineer and skydiver of the Indian Army Dental Corps, but she has been a, is a survivor of breast cancer and is the founder director of Highways Infinite. Of course, um, uh, this Highways Infinite Control Cancer Before Cancer Controls You, and it's, it has a ro role in bridge, to bridge people uh, with knowledge, resources, and expertise across the continuum of cancer in general for the prevention to end life, care, and beyond. And of course, um, she has an important role she in, uh, from uh, supporting uh, cancer patients, and so she will be also joining us. And finally, we have... Ms. Surva Vilas Patel. She is a patient representative. She's the deputy registrar of, uh, at Amra, uh, Amravati University in Maharashtra, but she's a COVID patient who's going to tell, uh, offer her uh, um, state. So uh, as a panelist, now it's very important that I uh, bring uh, Professor Mary Matthew, who is, uh, um, going to be the moderator. She is, of course, uh, um, who, um, an expert and a very distinguished moderator, having moderated more than 35 webinars over the last year in this, uh, in, in the various uh, the webinar, uh, the series that we've been running. So, uh, Professor Mary Matthew, over to you and welcome. Thank you, uh, Dr. Russell. And uh, before we go to the second part of our webinar, I just want to, um, uh, there are some questions for the previous speakers that I'd like to clarify. Um, uh, 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 Professor Vivian, uh, you were talking about uh, hidden victims. Mm. And uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the victims that always, uh, uh, who are always overlooked is uh, patients on dialysis. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. they, they are the ones, uh, because we did have a problem uh, uh, providing care for them yeah. and they were yeah. not able to access their medication, but right. uh, our nephrologists were so very good um, um, 
that uh, they arrange through the pharmaceutical com companies to uh, deliver uh, even during the lockdown to the patients. So um, they are also they also have uh, been victims of this pandemic. Another mm -hmm. um, another issue is about uh, obstetrics and gynae uh, care. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll be having in uh, two or three weeks time an op the obstetricians view point and what happened during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we'll be having interesting sessions on that. And I just want to tell the, uh, to all our three uh, speakers, uh, tw in 2019, the um, Times Magazine uh, released uh, uh, an article uh, which showed that, uh, showed which are the countries which were most prepared for the pandemic. And it was USA on the top and uh, followed by UK, Australia, and all the other, you know, well, uh, well-to-do countries. But we know that um, uh, uh, in reality, no one was actually prepared for this pandemic. And uh, it was really nice to see that um, uh, Professor Vivian giving uh, us uh, about the various laws and the systems that are, play, uh, that are already in place for UK. In fact, UK also had, um, they had a uh, dry, uh, they had a drill, in fact, for uh, the emergencies uh, regarding a pandemic, what should be done. But uh, we don't know what happened to that uh, report, uh, but it, it's really nice. Correct, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Vivian. You're muted, you're muted. No, no, you're quite right. We did have um, some preparation, but I don't know quite what Yeah, that to. report uh, was lost, mm. uh, you know. Mm. So, right. um, but it's nice to see that country, that at least UK has something in place and I hope it will it'll be sustained and uh, you can take it forward. My question right now is to all our panelists is, which, are the other countries really prepared for the next pandemic? Because uh, people are talking about bioterrorism now and you know, what is going to happen and you know, are we all prepared for this? So, um, because right now we are so overwhelmed with dealing with the pandemic itself that uh, I, I, I'm not sure whether governments are actually thinking about putting um, you know, uh, policies for the future. So that is something we should keep in mind that we should be, um, I mean, uh, that we should not be lax when it comes to um, uh, implementing policies for future pandemics. So um, I thank all the three speakers and uh, it was lovely um, uh, listening to all of you. And with that, we'll move on to the second session. And the second section is going to be very interesting because we have the viewpoint from uh, patients with COVID without those who didn't have COVID, but they had other illnesses and their struggles. And of course we have uh, patient advocates. So. Uh, uh, can I call upon Ms. Josie Chow to um, uh, come on screen? I will not give you uh, uh, tell you a lot about uh, Josie because her story itself, um, I will allow her to tell her story. So Josie, are you ready to share yes, your uh, PowerPoint? Uh, yeah, I'm um, uh, the presenters are most of the topics, but anyway, I will just um, share the screen a little bit. So you can just have a quick look of our condition now. So I am 26 years old now, and I suffered from spinal muscular atrophy type 1, which can be fatal before the age of 2. But um, Josie, can you put it on full screen, please? Oh, oh, oh sorry. Sorry. Just a minute. Thank you. Um, Oh, yeah. Here, here we go. Um, yes, I'm a fatal, but I'm very grateful. My mom and many advocates and great care from doctors. So I'm an English literature student at Hong Kong right now. And I'm also a, on the receptory for the um, respiratory support society and personal advocate for drugs and better quality of life from for families that affected by SMA. And this is the situation in Hong Kong now. So you can see the, the quite high 
numbers are affected, and then um, I think that's the mass re re resolution rearrange, and then uh, just a preview of the challenges faced by the registers or disabled community. Now we have we still have suspension of home based therapy and and professional care different services and sometimes they will open but uh, but the but if the but it will be suspended at the end if the numbers rising and then non emergency have to assert services such as tendon lengthening um, surgery which can which can uh which cannot have the optimal, the most optimal effect of the surgery because of the delay uh, under COVID-19. And then we also experience very slow process of orphan drugs introduction with for patients can be fatal and affect uh, the, the quality of life, which they can face uh, the loss of Mobility because of the delay of the introduction now, and some will also sacrifice their life, unfortunately, because of the delay of the of the offer drug. And then, um, so the, our caregivers and families is very stressful now, and. And then um, we are exploring the possibilities of tele telemedicine, but um, unfortunately, Hong Kong now is still very green in this aspect. And we are looking for some uh, challenges and uh, implementation models, maybe over here or in the future, to, um, to have the telemedicine which can help some people uh, without non-COVID, but have chronic or rare diseases. Yeah. That's, thank you for my, thank you for the attention. Thank you, Josie. Thank you, Josie. Um, Josie, thank what, you. Were, what were the challenges you faced as, uh, 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 with your problems when, it, uh, when there was a lockdown? Uh yeah, uh well Hong Kong is, has no official lockdown in in areas, but there are many services uh suspended like facial therapies, occupational therapies, and also as a patient with respiratory support we need close monitor of our settings or otherwise our Lung function uh, capacity uh, will be getting worse and increase the risk of COVID infection. But since all the all the hospital, the government hospital have um have postponed our appointments, so we are just staying at home and without any uh, professional monitoring. So um, many, many of our patients actually facing, um, facing the written muscles and, uh, and a very uh, serious respiratory illness, which can be prevented if they can treat it early. Okay, so uh, you were able to access the care? Sorry? Were you able to access the care that you required? Uh, no. Uh, that's why my mom and my caregiver we have a domestic helper help me only, but we don't have any professional care. And yeah, yeah right now. Oh, wonderful. Uh, it, it's I understand that you're a university student, Josie. Mm. Yeah. You're a university student? Yeah, I, I am working on my final year project now and trying to uh, link the connections of literature and disability 
issues, but I'm still brainstorming. Hopefully, I will okay. Have, yeah. Okay. Are you are you doing your masters or are you doing your bachelor's or? Uh, bachelor. Bachelor's. Final year. Okay. Really lovely. We feel so blessed just seeing you, Josie, and uh, you're so positive. Even in, when people are, uh, you know, distressed, that you give hope and you encourage, uh, you know, everyone. So thank you very much uh, for your contribution. I understand that uh, your doctor, Dr. Daniel, wanted to come in for the session, but I don't see him online, so I think he's not there. Oh, uh, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much, Josie. Oh. Thank you, Josie. Thank you very much. Uh, can, I, can I ask uh, Dr. Victoria? Dr. Uh, Victoria is from South Africa. Ricky. Um, Ricky, I yeah. Think... Thank you, Josie. Hi. Hello, everybody. Yeah, um, okay. Well, well, can you, you hear me? Well, we can hear yes, you, Ricky. You I think you came in a little late. Uh, I did. We were I'm we, sorry. Yeah, we were searching for you, but thank you. I understand that um, you are here as as an advocate or are you here as a patient or uh, what? What, what is your story? I'm a person who lives with many non-communicable diseases, some since birth. Okay. So I, I was born with psoriasis. And of course, in those days when I was born, nobody knew how psoriasis turned okay. into a major autoimmune disease. Okay. So would you like me to talk about the experiences? No, I would like to talk, uh, uh, you to talk about um, what were the challenges that you faced during this, when, um, uh, during this pandemic in accessing health care? And um, yeah. I think so, Josh, uh, Vicky represents the alliance. Is that right, Vicky? The yes, yes. Non-communicate and she's uh, advocating for the non-communicable diseases uh, alliance. Yeah. So I think, yeah. I can speak in both roles because yeah. be one, one came out of the other. So I live with more than 20 non-communicable diseases, um, which are in different stages. One of them is diabetes on uh, where I have insulin. I need require insulin. And about five years ago, we started the South African NCD Alliance and we have a number of uh, over a hundred organizations that work with us. Our, pri our primary job is to get policy equity for people living with non-communicable diseases. You will be aware that in South Africa, we had a huge, we had a very big burden of disease for HIV and TB. And, and while, while treatment and services for both of those conditions are e relatively easy to access in the public sector, the same is not true for non-communicable diseases. There is a huge inequity in those non-communicable diseases. So when, when the, I, I, for many reasons, some of them financial, I have, I transition to the public sector to get my care and I don't have personal health insurance. Okay. And, and that has been for about the last six months. Uh, not six months, it's over a year now. It's over a year now. But, but when COVID arrived, there was no way for us to, people living with NCDs to access the medicines, for example, and care safely. Mm -hmm. I'm at, at huge risk of severe disease and uh, should I catch it and and then I, I'm also at severe risk of dying should I get one of the illnesses get COVID and so as a person I needed to access my medicines through the state sector it was just too dangerous to go and stand in queues to go and and either try and get medicines or to go and get seen, start my treatment in the private sector. And so fortunately, I'm a healthcare professional. I have specialized somewhere in my life. I never thought I would have diabetes. And so I could manage, I can manage pretty well on my own. Mm. However, it's costing me a darn fortune and I can't get the medicines I need in the public sector. So anyway, 
because they aren't there. So they're not available. They use very old medicines and the, the insulins are very old. Okay. And, and so it has been tremendously difficult for, for many. And why can I say that is because of we also, I also ran a helpline. I ran a diabetes helpline from the beginning of, of COVID because I knew exactly what was going to happen. Okay. Um, I, I understood that there would be a problem with access. I understood that self-management was an issue. And, and, and some of the calls we got, we could, we could do with a colleague. I ran that with Rosanna Ali. We ran it and we did training. We gave infographics. We gave interventions where possible. Sometimes we helped to arrange medicine to be delivered to people who could not. One case was of a woman who lived in, in um, Cape Town. She had diabetes, type 1 diabetes. She had, um, she was pregnant with a child and she had, she had asthma and she had to travel because in our healthcare system, insulin, for example, is only available through higher than district level hospitals. She had to travel from her place all the way into the center of Cape Town on a taxi, public transport, greater risk of getting it and then come back. So that would have been a whole day's journey for this lady. And we were able through various means to get her medicine. And she was in her 28th or 29th. She was in her 31st week of pregnancy. So it was, um, it was, it was important. Then the other side of this, which are the social issues. We, we had a very strict and hard lockdown right at the beginning. And that lockdown terminated, disrupted food supply. And so for many people who are diabetic or who had their incomes terminated, they, they just ran out of food. And the food parcels couldn't get to them. And it was a, a deeply difficult time. And it still continues. Although the, the, the food supply shortages are, for many of the population are easing the nutritional aspects for all children and many of the more vulnerable people are, are, are still there. And we've got, we've got, we are risking a whole generation of people with food poverty and food insecurity. So I don't want to paint too bleak a picture, but I think it, it's highlighted for us the inequities in our health system where we are compare that to what goes on for HIV and AIDS, where they can get medicines. Most of the people with HIV and AIDS are, are in places where they can go and collect their medicines safely in a, in a district distribution. And that if you look at the statistics of that, the, the number of people with NCDs who are in that particular on those lists is minuscule. It's less than 20%, yet the burden is much higher. And so, so for us, and so we, we have lodged in this period now a, a case with our Human Rights Commission against our government because we believe there is policy inequity. Okay. And it was there before COVID, and it will be there after COVID unless something dramatic happens. And so it is for us... Thank you. I've spoken enough. I'm, I can go on for hours. I'm terribly no, sorry. <laughs> no, uh, Vicky, I just, I, uh, Ola, um, I mean, we have to do something more about the, the situation because, um, yes, uh, you know, the governments, uh, they haven't been, uh, you know, showing good leadership or even, you know, when it came to care and COVID. But can we do something more that we can have some sort of systems in place so that it, it does not happen again? I think we should be looking into that now, uh, you know, because uh, this is the time for us to have these kind of, uh, keep in mind, you know, how to work out these kind of problems and streamline it and not wait till the next pandemic or any other disaster happens. Absolutely, you know, 
health system strengthening in our country, unfortunately, only went as far as HIV rollout programs. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we have plenty to show. So one of the things is that we need the political will and the openness, and we need a focus on universal health coverage. And it needs to be so that equity is built in, built yes. on priorities in the built on priorities that are real in the community, not just donor fund projects. And so, so for me, this is the great tragedy of, of low and middle income countries is that, you know, they say Africa's protected that from COVID. It's just that we, we have no preparation in many instances. South Africa's got, got the capacity to do it. They just haven't had pol the, the political will. And will to do it. And, and that's what, if we are going to be real about UHC, it's not just about selected illnesses, it's got to be about those illnesses that are priorities according to epidemiological evidence-based issues in the community. And so it's perfectly doable. The big problem is that health, health system strengthening does not deal with integrated person-centered services. So the, the services have always, health system strengthening has always excluded patients from beginning to end. So to get a voice, unless you are out, so you need, patients need to fight and hold their governments accountable. And we do need it not to happen again. And this was perfectly predictable. It was absolutely on the card. So I don't know what the surprise is anyway. Yeah. Thank no, you. The citizen voice is very important, Vicky, because uh, uh, then only accountability comes in. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, you know, it'll keep on, uh, the same thing will keep on happening again and again. Quite right. Thank and you. So, so, sorry, it, I'm going to do my activist thing and say, we got to hold our governments accountable. Uh, uh, yes. It's not... It's not very easy because I tell you, you get vilified very quickly and put on a hit list that, you know, you're talking nonsense. I've, I have written to our Minister of Health for the last two years. He's never once responded to our complaints and all the rest. So go for it. We've got to get this right for the people, for the yes. ordinary people in our countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricky. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Can I call Mr. Mark? Mr. Mark? Mark, Hi, where? Can you hear Mark, me? Mark, are you there? Yes, yes, Mark. Okay, good morning from snowy Canada. Yeah, it's Mark, a... I, I brought you in for a particular reason because uh, you deal with patient engagement and you've been listening to all our, uh, the, you know, the, the stories, the sad stories regarding distribution and access to care. Uh, in Canada, was it difficult or because you heard Vicky say to go and get uh, just, uh, you know, her insulin uh, was a big, uh, you know, hurdle itself. How did it work out for access and care and equity when it came to Canada? Yeah, thank you again for the invitation. And, uh, you know, I've had the privilege over my 10 year career to really uh, make strides with patients to, to really advocate towards more patient centered care. Um, even a year ago, we developed a patient declaration of values for our, our provincial uh, healthcare system here in Ontario. And when the pandemic hit, that really, it, it, like the principles of patient-centered care really ran up very hard against um, public health, uh, public health measures and thinking about the collective good and well-being. And so very quickly, uh, I think, you know, a lot of patients um, were willing to, uh, you know, have some impediment to accessing care because there was a little bit of fear. Certainly, I think a lot of people knew that uh, there wasn't a great um, PPE, uh, personal protective equipment in the healthcare system. And, you know, so they were willing to forego um, some access to care. Um, but, you know, some of the, our areas of um, greatest concern actually weren't so much in, in the hospitals. People uh, ended up kind of going back to getting care there fairly quickly after uh, the pandemic started, because I think once, once the hospitals had, you know, really got their PPE and infection control, 
you know, in place. Um, there, there wasn't as many concerns there, but our, one of our biggest areas of concern actually was in long-term care. Yes. Uh, so there was some significant um, issues there, um, major outbreaks, um, and what actually, um, you know, started to become a really big issue here in Canada wasn't wasn't so much always access for patients accessing care, but it was it was the role of their loved ones in their care. And you know, we've really come to appreciate that. You know, if there's there's evidence to uh, based uh, on this that. Um, that caregivers play a significant role in the care of their loved ones. It leads to better outcomes, better experiences, greater ad adherence to treatment, and, and more active participation. And so, you know, um, there, was, there was a lot of concern about, the, you know, very strict uh, changes in policy around visitor guidelines, including in hospitals, um, but also in long-term care. And so um, it really shone a spotlight on, um, you know, the role that caregivers play in the care of their loved ones. And there, there's been over time, a number of national organizations have introduced policies to say, you know, it's, it's you can't just say everybody's a visitor. That's sort mm -hmm. of what they, uh, ha, the, the language had been around that there are certainly visitors, but then there's also caregivers and loved ones that play active roles in care. And most of the complaints that ombudsmen were receiving were, were around visitation policies. And so, um, you know, I think it kind of strikes to the heart of this has really been a struggle for, I think one of the speakers earlier, the humanity of healthcare has really struggled. And so, um, you know, there's been a lot of kind of stepping back and thinking about, okay, how do we, how do we make sure that we are um, providing care in this human way? Because, you know, people are, uh, as patients, you know, um, going a very difficult journey and they need their loved ones active in their care. Yeah, uh, and but so, there, there, uh, but Mark, there was uh, there's also an issue, a legal aspect of it too, because uh, you know um, uh, suppose you know the patient and the caregiver, you know they also fall ill, then uh, it becomes a legal issue totally. So I think it has to be taken with a lot of caution. Uh, these kind of policies, and we've heard that a lot of uh, uh, people in geriatric homes were dying without you know even seeing their loved ones we heard all that but um this is the time i think to work out solutions to problems like this that the family yeah, was yeah. never is never excluded when it comes to care yeah and i think there have been big steps to try to introduce technology and, and to try to you know find ways where we can resume some of those connections um but, but it's still been a struggle. Um, we've heard countless cases um, where, um, you know, patients uh, sadly are quite isolated and alone and um, their families really don't know what's going on with them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a family member actually who, who had contracted COVID and we really didn't hear anything about, we didn't know how they were doing. We didn't know when they might be, if they were going to be discharged. And um, yeah, it, it, it's been a, a real struggle. So yeah, I appreciate there's certainly been a lot of focus on yeah. some of the legal elements, but trying to reintroduce um, and, and make sure we haven't lost uh, some of the progress we've made towards patient-centered care and, and focus on um, patient involvement in their own care and family involvement. Yeah, the thing is also, Mark, here in India, we also had these issues of, you know, family not allowed to meet, um, you know, their loved ones. And when they died, they were not you know, given a decent burial, you know, we heard all these issues. So this is actually the time when we talk about, you know, human rights, human dignity, how to die with dignity and, uh, you know, caring uh, the role of a caregiver. I think it's very important. That's one thing that has brought up, this pandemic has brought out is this. So this is a very important issue. Thank you, Mark, for sharing it with us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, would you like to say anything, uh, share anything else, Mark? Um, I mean, the only other sector of care I'd like just to really touch on for one moment is in our primary care. Um, so the actual use of technology has really um, advanced the, and empowered patients in accessing care. Many patient advocacy groups had wanted virtual care for a long, long time. And almost overnight, the government funded this for primary care providers to do. And since then, it's been like a light switch has gone on. And I, I can't see us ever going back to a time where we don't have virtual care for primary care. And I think that's a huge 
win uh, for patients and their families in accessing care. When you say virtual care, what do you mean, Mark? Uh, so being able to access your provider through like this sort of technology uh, through webinars, but also even uh, even just using phone. I mean, it doesn't have to be extremely a, a laptop or yeah. It just means, yeah, you can access your primary care provider without having to be there in person. Um, okay, so and, this is a term that you use, a virtual care? Is that an accepted term that you use? Yeah, we say, that's, that's what we say here, yeah. Oh, that's a nice word. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mark. Can I ask, uh, may I ask uh, Captain uh, Ritu? Okay, I'm, I'm audible. Yeah, Ritu, yes, Ritu yeah. thank you for coming in. You're yeah, also yeah. Uh, a dentist. Are you still working with the army? No, I have left army and I'm also not working as a dentist. I'm more of a cancer warrior and I travel across the country driving a lot, uh, conducting cancer awareness workshop and trying to bridge the uh, common people to knowledge, resources and expertise wherever it falls into. Yeah, so uh, you have your own uh, story, I mean, that we can write a book on, uh, right, uh, Ritu? Yeah, so uh, uh, can you tell us your experience with this COVID-19 pan uh, pandemic? How was your experience and uh, um, do you have advice for, you know, uh, other people who are struggling with cancer and access to care? Yeah, so uh, firstly, thank you so much for getting me on the panel and it was, uh, I was delighted to listen to everybody who has spoken till now. Most of the points have been covered. Uh, what I found, uh, like uh, mostly, uh, I don't know, sometimes I feel India is a developed country and sometimes I feel we are still developing in many aspects. Uh, as far as health is concerned, um, yes, uh, there was a lot of problem because we had uh, almost five to six months of lockdown period and uh, patients uh, had faced, uh, like those who were suspected could not go for investigations in time. And those who were um, diagnosed could not reach uh, for treatment in time. And uh, medicines, I mean, those who needed medicine were treated and, uh, you know, needed some backup medicine or like a stock of medicine also couldn't reach. Um, uh, yes, there was fear of uh, COVID on either side of the parties, including the, the thing. But there were a lot of logistic problems which came in. Uh, apart from the hospitals being converted into uh, most of the hospitals being converted into COVID hospitals. And uh, so that's a totally different thing, which was re which really went out of hands in between. Uh, but the transportation was one of the major, major problem, uh, because uh, as we all know that we don't have cancer hospitals and I'm speaking specifically for cancer. Uh, we do not don't have cancer hospitals like uh, everywhere, like at major this thing yes. and there are times when patients are almost 200 300 maybe an overnight journey even 24 hours away from the choicest hospital also the hospitals are like government semi-government corporates and, and not everybody can afford and most of the population from rural did not have a choice of their own as to i mean a place where they can get a subsidized treatment or a and at the same time ngos like us were finding it difficult to provide uh, um, finances because we were also hard up and like we were literally juggling between the doctor and the investigation like doing like a vegetable marketing please reduce this much and please reduce that much so the main thing was uh, transportation and uh, a lockdown period was very long so what i uh, like i will just share quickly maybe it's a very minuscule uh, exp uh, work what we did compared to the huge uh, issue which was there was like uh, Patients who were like say within 100 and 200 kilometers from my place, Pune. And since I love driving, I took a special permission to hand over the medicines to them uh, directly. Uh, uh, I'm talking about the initial phases when, you know, nobody knew how it is like, uh, you know, everybody thought that COVID is everywhere in the air. Like, yeah. And uh, there was a option of relaying it, relaying the medicines. Uh, but then again, the fear was it might go into multiple hands. And we don't know by the time it, the package reaches. And uh, also, since I was staying in urban area, and though I am 60 plus, and I was protecting myself also as a senior citizen, uh, but uh, I ensured that I traveled only when I had not interacted with anybody for at least four or five days, because there were not so much of emergency of medicines like they could manage. 
and we used to meet the caregiver on the roadside not even entering in the rural areas which was still quite safe as compared to the pune and all where i was there then uh, second point was um, a lot of us we talk about telemedicine and a lot of us we talk about uh, digitization but as we are aware that not everybody has a smartphone uh, and uh, so that was becoming a huge uh, issue like if a patient is say about 4 hours away from the hospital and but we are consulting someone from uh, mumbai and that mumbai doctor will uh, will try and uh, connect us with a doctor nearest to it even if it's like a corporate hospital and uh, depending again on the covid situation the patient had to make specific uh, you know special vehicle like a taxi or you know request someone to you know fill petrol and fuel pumps were also closed for yes. many times that issues came up a lot and uh, uh, like uh, yes as a, a patient advocate it used to hit us badly because we used to handheld the patient till he reaches the doctor or the hospital and even cases which had hip fractures and metastatic and all traveling for us and all and it was really really pathetic okay. uh, one or two cases uh, i actually was very hurt and but then again you can't do anything much about it was the patient just gave up in between saying that he cannot uh, make uh, the caregiver said they cannot go to the hospital at least you know like it, it took two and a half months to come to some diagnosis and you know doing a blood test somewhere else going the uh, doing some um, investigation at a second place or a third place and again taking treatment at a fourth place and that uh, going through different hospitals was again a risk uh, you know because you were getting more and more exposed some patients also slept uh, um, the caregiver slept on the roadside under the tree Uh, that was in the month of summers which was also pathetic but uh, like taking this forward what i feel is now that we already have a lot of stories and there are like millions of stories you know every story is like uh, real life stories so what can we do for the um, yes. in a continuation which is still going on and if again another wave comes and things or another pandemic comes is uh, is the uh, i don't know how to do it in india though awareness is i mean we are trying all that but how do we connect uh, centrally uh, the doctors like the providers and the people who need um, care. care so that is one major thing considering uh, all said and done uh, because i have traveled extensively extensively three, uh, means almost 3 lakhs kilometers in last about 8 9 years in nooks and corners of india um, the phones are not everywhere Yeah, and definitely yeah. the smartphones are not everywhere yeah that's true so uh, ritu you're doing such a marvelous work in spite of all the difficulties i just i have a personal story that my a very good friend who's also a doctor and she had a um, ovarian tumor which she kept it for a long time during the uh, because of the lockdown and by time she came <clears throat> by time she came to the hospital it was like so huge Uh, that to take it the sur- surgeons had problems even taking out that ovarian tumor so people like this you know <clears throat> they have kept it for a long time some have you know um then uh, like you said they have given up and they yes. don't want to you know uh, 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 get treatment anymore so my question is how did you get the um, chemotherapy or the uh, the medications for the patients because uh, pharm- all the pharmacies were closed and you know those kind of things how did you get the medicines for them uh we tried to uh, some of the dealers i knew and some of the um, pharma companies we knew actually luckily uh, in covid times almost all the pharma dealers and all were functioning okay. Uh, okay. only thing was the major problem was the funding the money and the extra expenses which were coming due to transportation and of course um, a hospital like you cannot blame them also because if one person in one department needs to fall sick or was suspected then yeah, the system system collapses we are almost like 14 days so we had cases which had gone beyond and we had cases who even we could not help beyond certain limit and we also had uh, as i say it's always a sweet and sour experience in uh, our type of job that where an estimate has been given by a hospital and for no reason the hospital just hiked it up more than two times and the patient we couldn't provide Absolutely. more than that and the patient just said that's it i'm not taking my uh, the caregiver said i'm not taking my person any anywhere 
and then there our hands get tied tied up because we can only reach as a patient advocate to a certain level we can handle the patient to a certain level yeah and uh, medicines were of course uh, expensive uh, i think the major problem came in india because the public transports were not open yes yes that's true that's true and uh, not another thing what i have seen is a hospital which is a full fledged cancer hospital still had a uh, still has like choices because most of them i don't think so were converted into like covid hospital but uh, and such hospitals are again not uh, everywhere i mean they are very less but the multi specialty hospitals which were converted into covid at least in the first 6 months 7 months 8 months uh, they uh, the patients suffered there a lot because uh, they could not reach the cancer full fledged cancer hospitals cancer, yeah. yeah thank you very much uh, dr ritu for sharing your experiences Um, can Thank I you. ask, uh, uh, Doctor Al- Al- Alessandra, is there, Doctor Alessandra? Uh, yeah. Doctor Alessandra yourself? is Hi. From, uh, from Brazil. Yes, I'm. I'm a lawyer in Brazil for uh, not government medical association in the state of Minas Gerais. The which seeks guarantee the rights and patients and doctors in a uh, structure. private and public system healthcare uh alessandra what was the what was your experience as a patient advocate in brazil uh, what were the problems that you faced and uh, did you have any success uh, you know any success stories uh, during this pandemic right now we have a, a big problem here in the state because the the government decides suspend all the considered elect surgeries except the cardiac and oncological is in a right but in both system in a private or public system there this is suspension because we have um a large cases in in covid patients because we have the no no issues and the the people do not respect the the restriction mm. we have during the carnival fest period here so we have a uh, rise in the cases and all the the surgeries is suspended right now and is is a bad thing because the patients need the treatment yeah. yes because we have some simple problems can resolve but now i think this is going to worse because don't have the the entertainment and the doctors at cause is put in in a balance because this so is complicated for here right now in brazil uh, is a lockdown going on in brazil some cities some states some some locations here in my state the the lockdown is not strict the most uh, the more restriction right now we have some mobilities in my, like in the states like bahia in salvador we have the lockdown all the people cannot access care anywhere. they can't access care uh... even as the scare only the patient only the covid patients can go to to the hospital you think this restriction is very very bad very because yeah. well, 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 how do you, how do you support them alessandra how do you support them we have some legal advice to to use to get and and to attendment but is very complicated is 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 awful actually okay. all right so it, it, it's a very difficult situation because pay, uh, people can't access care and i think probably all the hosp- uh, healthcare workers also have to be careful so um uh, treatment becomes a problem yes in a in a private system we having the, the telemedicine in is a way to amenize the problem is 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 very very small yeah and very yeah. yeah how many people also can access telemedicine not everybody can 
Yes, exactly. This is a yeah. problem. So I think this is a global problem. Pro problem. I mean, we are talking about the same things. We are all in the same boat. It looks like. Yes, I, I, in the panel, we saw that all the countries in first, first, third the world, we have the same problem oh, right now. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Alessandra, for your contribution. Um, it's nice to hear your views from Brazil and uh, your rep uh, representation from that country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, can I call um, uh, Mrs. Uh, Suleba is there? Sorry. Yes, she is. is? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Suleba. Yes, uh, you can go ahead, please. Yeah, we can't we can't see you but the picture i think you can you can yes yeah. thank you hello am i audible ma'am yeah yeah we, yeah 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 you have a story Suleba. tell us your story yeah, yeah yeah good evening everybody and uh, thank you so much for inviting me for such a wonderful event indeed it's a privilege for me uh, i have been detected covid positive and that is how i am here uh, one of the panelists. Initially, when the pandemic was declared, no one was aware what really a pandemic is and what is going to happen. And everybody was so scared and fearful here. I reside in Nagpur in Maharashtra. And um, the normal people, normal people were so scared, even if they were having uh, fever or headache, or pain. they were not willing to go to hospital just because of the fear that if they visit a hospital, they'll be detected COVID positive. And what consequences were there? Like uh, if you're detected COVID positive, you will be isolated. And people had the fear that they're going to die because of COVID. And once you die, you will be wrapped in a polythene uh, this and you will be just, they, they will, there will be no one even to cremate you. That was the situation. It yes. was a horrible situation. Horrible situation. Yeah. No one was willing to, even your relatives, your the uh, health, health workers were not allowing the relatives to visit also. And the relatives were also, they separated, they kept themselves aloof. So yes. it was a very, very horrible situation. Nobody was very sure what to do, what to touch, what to wear, whether to really breathe or not, what is harmful. Yeah, th that was the situation of a common man. Yeah. The government was very, uh, like India being a very dense and very densely populated uh, country, government took a very quick step in lockdowning. They locked down and I thought that is the reason why it did not spread. But then again, uh, a major problem was created because in India, many people are working from different parts of the country. They are not working in their own cities or in their own villages. But due to lockdown, the, uh, the machinery, the in industries, they locked themselves, but the workers were also locked in the major cities and the urban cities, yes. and they could not migrate to their uh, the towns. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And they had to walk distance, like they have to walk down to their home at any cost. That was the major problem. But I would say that uh, common man was, again, they came to help. People were very helpful in giving them food and everything across their way. Though transportation was not there, but people were willing to help them. As so, I, I want to know about your, your experience. Uh, are you yeah. COVID free now? Are you okay? Are you out of... Uh... No, no, not yet. I am still uh, in isolation and the medication is going on. So you're uh, isolated at home or are you isolated in the hospital? I, I'm isolated at home. Okay. I'm isolated at home because the doctor said that the infection is not so much that you don't require hospitalization. You need to isolate at home. So I'm home quarantine. I'm taking my medicines still under medication. I need to isolate myself for 15 more days. But here also, when you are home isolated, you have to ensure that you don't touch anybody who, who are around you. You are not supposed to. You have to be like uh, untouchable if at all you want to protect your. Yeah, because uh, your family, your family members also may be scared, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So if at all you want to protect your near and dear ones, you have to keep aloof. You have to detach yourself. Yeah. All right. But are, are you feeling well? Are you okay? 
yeah i am okay i am feeling well uh, yeah. the medicines that i have been giving are doing excellent okay so uh, yeah. because see for uh, people like who who are well to do probably it is not a very difficult issue but you know the common man the poor man for them it becomes very very difficult because they can't uh, first and foremost there is no work there is no money uh, uh, jobs are very scarce you know very scarce now so the suffering is more at a you know a low at the low uh, socio economic uh, uh, levels emotionally all all levels suffer emotional yeah. problems are the same but i think the brunt has been faced by the rural and the low socio economic uh, uh, people true. in india yeah very yeah thank you so much silva for sharing your experience thank you. thank you so much yeah uh faith uh, miss faith i i kept you purposely for the last because you are a patient uh, uh, uh advocate okay. and uh, you advocate for equality and human rights especially you, your work is more on uh, if i'm not mistaken on sickle cell correct and thalassemia yeah yes yeah that's correct yeah so um you are going to tell us about the problems that um these patients had in um accessing care especially because it is a um it is a genetic condition which is uh, you know uh, they need treatment lifelong so they would have faced uh, i'm i'm sure there are many other conditions but this is what you are specialized in so tell us the problems that uh, as an advocate uh, how could you help them and um, you know what were their problems okay thank you thank you for the invitation to come to speak um today um i'm so privileged i feel so privileged to be on this platform can i just give you a little bit of background about the ethnicity uh, in wales Uh, Wales is one of the least ethnically diverse part of the UK. Um, um, in Wales, is ninety six percent of the population is white, um, and the other and um, over half the ethnic minority population in Wales is Asian, um, or Asian British is two point three percent. The largest group is Indian, zero point six percent, followed by Chinese in Bangladesh. and then the black and british group makes up to 0.6% of the population um if i talk a little bit about personally i was infected me the covid uh, my mum has got um, dementia and okay. um, so i wasn't able to see my mum um only through um, virtual and in august she was on end of life care pathway oh. um thankfully because the hospital operates from a person centered care that um, our family was able to go in to see her. Um, my mum is such a strong character. She says she's not ready to go yet. Um, although she lost her, um, her um, able to communicate um, months and months ago, six months prior COVID, um, when we went in to see her, she, she started speaking again. And um, thankfully my mum is still with us and, um, and survived COVID. A couple of weeks ago, she contracted COVID and she's still uh, fighting. um with regarding sickle cell and thalassemia um during covid um most of the families had to stop working so there was no income coming in at home this actually impacted greatly on uh the families because there was no money and the lower social yeah. ethnic yes. economical um backgrounds so with funding from um we seek funding and was able to deliver food parcels um to some families 13 families all together i delivered food parcels um while doing that i was able to um to see how um marginalized and isolated they are within in, in within their communities um within the communities uh, um a working class white areas and they were the only black families um in that area there was no access to public transport okay. or very or very difficult um access to public transport uh, one family um had to take their child into hospital um for a blood uh have a blood exchange and they are, they were on public transport for 4 hours okay um two little children 10 year old and the and the boy is uh, very young um the, the parent was absolutely frightened because when the first lockdown during covid everybody was so scared about how to how they were able to um about the virus they didn't know how it's going to contract it 
Um, so the, the parents were absolutely uh, petrified. Um, I was the only contact that the families had seen um, because they were, they were so frightened regarding COVID that they didn't leave their front doors. So I was able to deliver parcels and I was the only outside person that they were able they were seeing. So it was almost like um, giving counselling. I've got a bit of a counselling background. Um, at the doorstep, um, two metres apart, um, seeing parents break down, um, frightened about their child, um, thinking would their child go into a crisis, um, no money coming into the household, um, English as a second language, um, some families have got no recourse to public funds, and you probably, uh, Faith, probably you wouldn't have got blood for transfusion either. Yes, they were, they were Shorted. bloods in the hospital. Yeah, yeah. in Cardiff. Um, we've just got an, a, a recently commissioned service by the Welsh Health Specialist Service Committee. Um, um, got a service for um, sickle cell disorder, thalassemia disorders and other rare conditions. And we, no, and but, uh, was it, wasn't there a shortage of blood during the lockdown? No. No, okay. Not, so not in Wales. Have, not we didn't have, we didn't experience um, that difficulty. Yeah, okay. um, no, we didn't. The families didn't report back to me that. Because I'm that trying was. to I'm trying to think about you know patients with thalassemia and sickle cell anemia here in India, where they're dependent on transfusions and usually it is a donor, and this lockdown actually probably wouldn't have you know. Um, uh, or would have uh, blocked all the donors from coming and giving blood. So I'm surprised that Wales had a stock of uh, blood for transfusion. And, and when the first lockdown, um, it, uh, contact with the hospital was challenging. Um, but um, as an advocate, and you advocate for uh, your um, for your patients, um, the communication with um, the consultants became. Um, uh, better then, <laughs> and um, and we and we worked out different ways to access the hospital, and um, which was safe for um, our members. Yeah. So, uh, but I, on the whole, I think that the parents would have suffered also because the fears of uh, you know, will their child get treatment and you know how frequently they they get the treatment and any complications also, dealing with the complications of transfusion or any other, you know, problems would have been really frightening for them. It was frightening when um, a few children were admitted into hospital with um, sickle cell, with sickle cell crisis. One child had um, iron overload. Yeah. Um, um, the mum, only one parent was allowed into the hospital with a child. So um, it was dad was allowed. Um, dad went in with the child. So mum was so upset and um, would just, when I used to deliver food, because there was no physical touching, um, I had just have to comfort by my voice um, as um, as I watched them. Um, yeah. Absolutely upset. It was devastating. It's been, it's, been, it's been devastating. I still continue to do food parcels to the families. Um, I started in April. I still um, continue to do food parcels to families now. It takes about five hours, six hours to deliver food to the families. Um, a positive, if is there a positive in COVID, is the virtual uh, networks. Are we able to have um, meet the families virtually um, um, via Zoom? So yeah. we're able to discuss and share um, um, challenges. That's, that's been a positive. Okay. And another positive is that um, I've been part of this support a, a support group for sickle cell and thalassemia for 21 years. I was a carer for my uh, my friend um, whose twins got the disorder. And um, during COVID, we realised that we, we can no longer be a support group, and we've come um, become a um, social enterprise. So we're able to um, access funding from the lottery, the national lottery and um, Community Foundation Wales. So we're able to have funding, so be able to better support each other um, okay. during this challenging time. I, I think uh, uh, you've been fortunate to have funding and uh, no short supply of uh, blood. And that's a very good thing. Thank you, Faith, for uh, sharing your experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, just before I end, I'd like to call in uh, Ritu again. Uh, Ritu, could you come in again and uh, you'd like to say something, I believe?
yeah, uh, uh, on a very, very positive note, uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, what also I have seen, uh, in spite of all the traumas, uh, both physical, mental, economical, and uh, physical—I mean, everything on all aspects—that the community, the power of community, was very strong in India, and especially when we had the issues of the uh, homebound rural uh, workforce, the shramiks, the migrants issues, and uh, even as uh, when there was a requirement of. lot of other things like medicine money or food or blood and all uh, individual uh, people a lot of individual people in spite of the scare of uh, covid uh, came out on the roads to help yeah yeah that's 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 the beautiful part of being uh, uh, you know a human yes you so humanity that. was at its peak you can say yeah. and uh, learning lessons from both both aspects uh, i think we also need to prepare uh, we can't just lo- sort of you know uh, slack back like that but we need to work and uh, make some interconnectivities and yes. for future future yeah right thank you very much uh, thank, thank you so you. much so uh, i think uh, we've extended gone beyond our time and i thank all our speakers and um, all our panelists for sharing their experiences um this is what brings us all together that we are all uh, at the end of the day you know we are all um, human and uh, when we share our experiences then we are not alone and yeah. um, uh, it's not only in india but it's also all over the world we are seeing our experiences are similar so this is basically for us also it's really uh, marvelous to see all of you and um, that we support each other and probably take back um, you know po- uh, on a positive note that we can do something more and the job is still unfinished and we can you know we have to still uh, soldier on uh, whether we are advocates or whether we are a patient or uh, you know um, uh, in whatever capacity we still need to continue in this pandemic so i thank all of you as, uh, especially those who have got up early in the morning to attend and uh, probably uh, those who are uh, past their bedtime like uh, Dr. Russell and Das Kahel, uh, who are still up. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for all your contributions. And um, uh, I think we will not ask any more questions because all of us look real, uh, uh, really tired, and you know. But thank you for the same. So I think I will uh, hand it over to Dr. Russell. Thank you, Dr. Mary. Thank you for that. Uh, I think again. Uh, uh, this, as Mary, as you said, we were again seen. Um, what what are we learning from this? You know, that's what we're trying to distill out. West or one clear uh, uh, um, thing that comes out is solidarity, right? That's uh, we are all here from around the world. We're sitting together, and what do we hear? We see champions there. We see people. <laughs> In, in these uh, uh, terrible times, they're still uh, giving hope. They're still doing things, and I think uh, it's great. Uh, we, but more importantly, I think, uh, as Dr. Mary said, we are doing this. We brought um, all of our different um, uh, colleagues from around the world in different disciplines together. But one of the things we should be doing is to start thinking. We are. We are experiencing something that probably in a in a lifetime for many you no know, one has seen this and so we need to be able to distill so that this can be a, a learning experience for not just pandemics but an epidemic or and so forth understanding and we we have with the uh, with the various with the pharmacy group they've come out uh, from our from this uh, expert guidelines the nursing have come out with some ex- ex- expert they published it but just from the chair, the the, um, um, the the webinar coming together um, the similarly uh, the physiotherapists are on the web of uh, putting out an expert uh, guidelines and so forth so i think this will be a great uh, opportunity and uh, we should um, um, <clears throat> take all what we've learned here this is very important because um, this is from the patient the advocate and really importantly we've all focused on covid covid 
uh, for the last uh, one year or so. And now we're learning from uh, Wiki, from others, uh, who what, what they're going through. For the non-COVID patients who, you know, uh, are, are also needing care, needing help, needing, uh, and Josie and others have spoken about uh, what has happened to them. And uh, I think uh, that we should be here um, taking all what we've learned and probably preparing all this. So with that coming together in solidarity, let me once again thank uh, our uh, very distinguished first three speakers, uh, Dr. Um, uh, uh, Professor Vivian um, Hopwood, uh, our Jessna and Dr. Jessna, and of course, Dr. Nancy Belinga, who um, for the excellent uh, setting the scene with those presentations. And then the wonderful um, panel, very distinguished panel from uh, Dr. Uh, um, uh, Wiki from South Africa, <coughs> Dr. Alexander from Brazil, yes, Dr. Fair and Ms. Faith uh, Walker from United Kingdom, J Josie uh, from Hong Kong, uh, Mark Veer from Canada, and of course, Dr. Captain Ritu uh, from India, and our patient, uh, um, um, this, yeah, representative from there. Uh, so uh, that is Dr. Suluba Mulas Patel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dr. Suluba, uh, Mr. Suluba. Thank you all so much for joining us today. We want, uh, we appreciate this, and we will be continuing with yes, our, uh, our, web our webinars. I think there's one, I think, that's going to come up, which will be another interesting. I think we should ask uh, Nancy to think about it. This is on miscommunication, uh, conspiracy, and vaccine resistance. Is that right? Someone is one of our colleagues from uh, UK, uh, from Europe has done a study on eight countries looking at this area. So we're going to take this around the world in 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 uh, probably the seventh of March. I think will be the day that uh, we'll be looking at uh, the 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 place, the role of miscommunication. <laughs> and conspiracy and vaccine resistance. And look at how it goes around the world. We also are going to have the dental fraternity. Our colleagues, they've had two and they're going to have the third one, I think in two weeks from now. And then of course, as Mary said, we also have the obstetricians and gynecologists who want to talk about bringing together what they've been through. Uh, and so that's what we're going to be doing. So thank you all very much and uh, thank you um, uh, uh, this, we, we are both, it's almost two o'clock in Melbourne. We're actually in the next day. So we'll, uh, we, we've moved to the next day uh, and, and, and lift you back on Sunday. Des and myself and some others have moved to Monday. Thank you all once again. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, stay safe, stay well, and to meet bye -bye. again. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.